when we talk about academic honesty, what we're really talking about is avoiding academic dishonesty, right? Which is academic stealing and lying. Um, when we think about the fact that we can honor God in the way that we approach our assignments, that kind of raises it to a different level. When we're on the fence of, do I need to cite this? Do I not? Do I, do I have to put quotation marks? Do, when we start thinking about, okay, can I please God as I do this even, even in these small things, then we start to, things will start to become more clear, I believe, um, because we'll look harder for what's the right thing to do. But what most students want to know is, okay, what constitutes academic dishonesty? When am I crossing the line? And I think that we're all really familiar with the idea of copying a friend's work. That's clearly academic dishonesty. Um, but so is making up references or knowingly using incorrect references. I, I don't know. I think I got it from page thus and such. I don't know, that'll be good enough. No, nobody's really gonna check that. What about padding your references to make it look like you used more research than is actually cited in the paper? Even if you read 15 different sources, if you only used four of them in the paper, you only cite, you only put in your references those four. It's great that you looked at 15, but you can only put in the ones that actually showed up in the paper. Academic dishonesty can be getting lots of help from one or more friends. Now I know that, that it's, you know, studying together can be a good thing, and I'm not saying that you can never um, get help from another student, but when you've taken your assignment and gone from friend to friend to friend, to just have them look at it, make suggestions, get, put corrections on it. If it's gotten to the place where this is no longer really your work, but we've got input from lots and lots of people, that's not what your instructor is looking for. I don't want to see what corporately everybody can do. I want to see what you can do. Um, and what it comes down to is anytime you get help, that you don't learn from. So if I drop my paper off with so-and-so and they mark it all up for me because they're good at this stuff and they mark it up and give it back to me, have I learned anything if I just go in and, and make those corrections? Probably not. Probably not. So the key to avoiding academic dishonesty really is learning. That we, our work needs to reflect what we've learned and it needs to reflect that we are learning. So getting down to the nitty gritty, we talk about then, well, plagiarism. And everyone knows that plagiarism is taking someone else's words. Um, so what about copying a friend's notes from class? Is that plagiarism? What do you think? No. You're going to say no? Why not? Right, the, the notes, it's, it's not plagiarism. If you missed the lecture or you didn't take good notes during the lecture and somebody else did and they're willing to share with you, that's not a problem because you're not being tested on the notes. You're not turning those in. That's just information from the class. Unless you were assigned to take notes and turn those in, then it would be, then it would be copying and we'd be into academic dishonesty. So something like that is not plagiarism. You're not being graded on it. That's just information that was given freely, like you said. Um, but what about if in a paper I use a graph or some type of illustration? Um, do I need to cite that and say where it came from? It's not words and plagiarism is copying someone's words. So, can I just use that? No. You have to cite it. If you don't, it's plagiarism. You have to say where that graph came from. Unless 
you made it yourself, and then, of course, it's original. Plagiarism is any time you imply that a group of words or an idea is your own when it isn't. So Grammarly.com identifies four categories of plagiarism. Direct plagiarism, and this is one we're familiar with, taking another person's ideas word for word without giving them credit. But there can also be self-plagiarism. If you turn in a paper that you wrote for another class without asking permission, that's plagiarism. Self-plagiarism. You're not allowed to do that unless you have gone to the instructor ahead of time and said, I just did a paper on this topic for another class. May I turn it in again? And they say, sure, that's fine. Then you have no problems. But if they say, no, I really am looking for you to learn something through a process, so here's how I want you to um, refocus, or here's a different subject I want you to study about, um, that's what you would need to do for that class. Accidental plagiarism. I think this is probably um, what happens more often, forgetting to cite sources or paraphrasing sources without giving proper credit. And we're going to talk more about what it looks like to paraphrase sources. But when you use somebody else's, even if you're not using their words, if you use their ideas, you have to give them credit for that idea. And then mosaic plagiarism. Quoting another person's words without using quotation marks. In other words, I just, I just kind of lifted that and put it into my paper. We call that mosaic plagiarism. Or just using synonyms to replace a few words of a quote while maintaining the same structure and meaning. So let's look at an example. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. You're familiar with Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. So if I take and say, okay, I, I don't want to plagiarize his words, so let me just paraphrase. And I say, 87 years before today, our forefathers established in North America a brand new country that was built on the idea of freedom and was committed to the concept that all people have equal value. I didn't use the same words. So is that now a paraphrase? What do you think? Because I don't want to plagiarize. I don't want to just use his words. I, I, want, to, I want to put it in my own words. But, but do you see how it's, it's pretty close? I mean, instead of four score and seven years ago, I said 87 years before today. So we start with the idea of time. And then our fathers brought forth on this continent. Our forefathers established in North America. We're taking it kind of phrase by phrase and putting it in our own words. A new nation conceived in liberty. A brand new country that was built on the idea of freedom. We're taking it idea by idea by idea. We're really not changing much, even though it's different words. So this is not a very good paraphrase, even though you've used your own words here. It would be better... In the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln said that out of their commitment to the idea of freedom, you see we've led now with a different, a different idea uh, that was from this. It has all the same ideas, but we've rearranged it a little bit. Out of their commitment to the idea of freedom, the founders of the United States formed a new country that recognized the equality of all men. And then I give where it was taken from. So that would be a better paraphrase, where I've taken the ideas, but I've completely put them in my own words, and I rearranged how, the order in which the ideas were presented. Um, a paraphrase is not always shorter, and that's something you need to know. In fact, sometimes a paraphrase is longer. The author was able to say it with um, more directness and more economy 
then maybe I'm able to restate it in my words. A summary would look more like, in the Gettysburg Address, Abraham Lincoln reminded his audience that the country's founding fathers loved freedom and believed in equality. And so now we've summarized it. We've taken the, the kernel of the idea and just stated it in fewer words. To avoid plagiarism, quotation marks must be used for direct quotations. If we're paraphrasing, there must be more than superficial changes to the original text. The original author must always be given credit, and the reader must be directed to where that original information can be found. And that's kind of the heart of it, is we have to be able to accurately direct the reader if the reader wants to go back and check and read more for themselves. So if we don't want to plagiarize, how do we go about giving credit to the author? There's a right way to do that. And to credit the author, you need to do two things. You're going to have to do in-text citation, and you're going to have to use a reference page. And we're going to look at an example from um, the Purdue OWL. And this is a site I hope you become very, very, very familiar with. So if we're writing, and this is just an excerpt, a pretend excerpt from the middle of a paper, I've put in bold, you would not want to do this in your paper, but this is so that we can see clearly. I've put in bold what in-text citation looks like. You see a sentence started with Cummings, Butler, and Kraut, and then in parentheses the year that that information was published, suggests that face-to-face -face interactions are more effective, blah, blah, blah. All right, so that in-text citation, we have given credit to the author. And in APA format, we also have to give the year that that information came out. And then you see a little lo la later, after the ellipses, defined as a sharing of a person's innermost being with another person, that is self-disclosure. And we see another in-text citation. Because we did not use a signal phrase saying that who would Smith and Westbrook um, define sharing as a person's innermost, we didn't lead with that, which is called a signal phrase. Instead, we put that into parentheses, and that is the in-text citation. Do you notice that little ampersand? after Smith, comma, ampersand, Westbrook. Could I have done that up at the earlier one, where it said Cummings, Butler, and Kraut? Could I have used that ampersand there to save some space, save myself a couple keystrokes? You see the ampersand? You see that, that little and symbol? That's called an ampersand. OK. so. Could I have used that up in the text where it says Cummings, Butler, and Kraut? It's not in parentheses, exactly. So in my text, in my writing, when I'm writing it out, I have to spell out the word and. But if I'm down in the in-text citation and I'm in APA format, which you will be, if you're in the in-text citation within that parentheses, Let's be more clear about that. If you're within the parentheses, you actually have to use the ampersand and not write out the word and. If you're within the parentheses there. Mm -hmm. If you're outside of the parentheses, use the word and. If you're inside the parentheses, use your ampersand. This is, again, APA format. If you were writing in a different format, in a different place, there would be different rules. But this is APA format. You see, though, in both places, whether I um, gave the author's credit in a signal phrase outside of the parentheses, I still had to immediately, in parentheses, put the year of publication. That's required in APA format. In the second example, where I give the author's credit within the parentheses, I still had to put the year. In APA format, that is required. If this would have come from a book, there would have been a page number. And I'll show you an example of that here in a little bit. 
but there would have been a page number that followed that 2004. So the question is, when exactly do I need to put in a citation or use quotation marks? Again, we're going to come from the Purdue OWL. These are things that need to be cited. Words or ideas presented in a magazine, a book, a newspaper, a song, a TV program, a movie, a web page, computer program, letter, advertisement, or any medium. You have to cite information you gain through interviewing or conversing with another person face to face or over the phone or in writing. When you copy the exact words or a unique phrase from someone else. When you reprint any diagrams, illustrations, charts, pictures, or other visual materials. When you reuse or repost any electronically available media, including images, audio, video, or other media. The bottom line, if it originated outside of you, cite it. Do not cite. If you're writing about your own experiences, observations, insight, thoughts, conclusions about a subject, you don't need to cite that. Writing about your own results of a lab or a field experiment, your own artwork, your own photographs, your own videos, audio recordings, etc. You don't cite that. And you do not cite when you use generally accepted facts. Something like, pollution is bad for the environment. You don't have to cite that. When you're using common knowledge, things like folklore, common sense observations, myths, urban legends, historical events, but not historical, historical documents. So how do I know if something's common knowledge? Sometimes we want to know that. How do I know? So here's your rule of thumb. Generally speaking, you can regard something as common knowledge if you find the same information undocumented in at least five credible sources. It might also be common knowledge if you think the information you're presenting is something that your readers will already know or something that a person could easily find in general reference sources. But even then, if you're in doubt, cite it. If the citation turns out to be unnecessary, we'll let you know. So if you have any more questions about plagiarism, ask. I am happy to answer them. And if I don't know the answer, we'll look it up together. So let's speak specifically now about formatting. You may have used other format types, MLA, Chicago. Really, in the important ways, they're not all that different. Because all formats teach us that other people's words and ideas need to be cited both in the text and in a list at the end. That's the whole point of citing. And there is basic information that must be included in the citation. All the different formats require the same information. The difference is there are nitpicky ways to communicate that information. And so each format has its own nitpicky way that we're going to communicate that same information. But OHC has adopted APA as our standard format, and that begins this year. And I'm glad to make you happy, Laura. So. <laughs> All right, so a cover page, APA requires a cover page. MLA did not. And I'm sorry, on here I was not able to put margins, so you have to imagine one inch margins around all of this. Okay, so that, that's, that's your job to do because I couldn't figure out technically how to do it. On the cover page, you need to have the words running head and the title all in capitals and the page number. And then in the middle, you have the title, your name, and the name of the school that you're attending and writing for, where you're taking the class. Page two, it no longer says running ahead. Now it has the title um, still in caps at the top. An abstract is common. In, in fact, it's, it's required in APA format, but your teacher may waive that. I, I regularly waive the abstracts for a paper. It's in my, 
um, syllabus. I'll say it needs to be in APA format, no abstract required. But I know that, and it, and it works better for some of our disciplines. Um, but I know that Dr. Satya regularly requires an abstract and an introduction. So it depends on what your teacher requires and they'll make that clear to you. So you do not have to, instructors, you do not have to require an abstract. In fact, you're free to adapt as you like. Just, just let them know. All right, and then if an abstract was required, your page three will look like this. You will have still that running head, the title going across the top in all caps. You'll still have your page number there at the top right. Then you'll have your title and then your paper begins. Um, and you see that I put in bold there. Please, you would not put in bold in your paper. I've only done this so that we can see it together. Okay, but you would not put your in-text citations in bold. But I gave you an example there. Nickel was the author, so the last name, then a comma, then the year, then a comma, and this was taken from a book, so there is a page number, so you have to put the P, little p, just one, and the period, and then the page that it was taken from. Do you notice that when I do a citation, the period goes after the citation? Not before the parentheses, after the parentheses. Even if the words before it were in quotation marks and in a direct quotation, that period does not go inside the quotation marks, it goes at the end outside of the parentheses, and that's true in every format. This is important. There's a direct correlation between your in-text citation and your references page, and we're about to see that, okay? So we're looking there. Nickel was cited, and if I am the instructor and I'm like, hmm, I know he's written several things. I wonder which book this came from. And so your instructor immediately, instead of finishing your paper, they're like, yeah, I wonder what Nick, where Nickel wrote that. And so they flip to the reference page, and they need to find Nickel there. Not all students recognize that what you put in your text needs to show up on your reference page. There's a direct connection between these. Nothing goes on the reference page that did not show up in the text. And everything that showed up in the text needs to be on your reference page. Again, you would not put anything in bold on your reference page. I did that just so that we could see this. Um, you'll notice that we do have that hanging indent that you should remember for those of you who did MLA format. It's still like that. Everything is still in alphabetical order. There are slight differences between the formats, though. For example, in APA, notice that we just use first initials. Um, we use an ampersand, the little symbol for and. After the names always come the year. Um, and then you see after the year comes the title, and then the, where it was, the name of the book that it was in, um, with the volume and issue number, if it was a periodical, and then the page numbers. These kind of nitpicky things, you'll find how to do them at your Purdue OWL. And so that's where we will send you to figure these things out. You will, you'll be able to look at whether it's your journal article or the book, and you'll say, okay, I see the name, I see the year, I see the page numbers, I see the title, I, I see the volume and the issue. What order do I put these in? You go to the Purdue OWL and it will show you so that you get it correct when you put together your references. It is important what order these things come in. That's what makes it APA format. It is important that you put a comma where they say a comma. There's a comma after the last name, then the initial with the period after the initial, then a comma. 
And if there's another last name, it just continues that way until before the last one, you put the and. All right, there's a period after we put the year in parentheses, and then comes a period. That's part of what makes the format, and that's what you're expected to know and to do. If you have questions, again, I'm happy to help you. Your instructors will help you through it, and we will all learn together and come out stronger for it. Yes, a question. Wonderful, thank you so much. There's also, if you used a little seagull, if you were in class with me last year or going to be, um, we use little seagull. It has APA format. I have a copy at my desk. There's a copy in the tutoring lab. And so, and then in the library will be an APA, three copies of an APA manual so that we are without excuse. All right, thank you so much. And shall we bow our heads together as we finish here? Father, you've called us to be perfect, even as you are perfect. And that is a high calling. And we thank you that you've promised to work in us, to change us, to make us into your image. We trust you for the big things and the small things. And we're happy to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.